All right, turn to your Bibles to uh, the Word of God in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. It is important for us to remember that there cannot be forgiveness. There cannot be remission of sins. Remission means sending away. Literally, the word remi remitted means your debts are remitted. That means what? They are sent away into oblivion. It will no, no longer come back to haunt you. So the Bible used the word remission of sins. It's the same Greek word for forgiveness. Aphemi, sending away, remission. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says in Hebrews, there is no forgiveness or remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood. It cannot just be blood. It's got to be holy blood, blameless blood, sinless blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then we see the gospel story of how God sent His Son. God could have sent Jesus stepping out of a cave, a full-grown man. But then, that would not minister to our comfort because we, we, we will think of Him as a being from heaven, but He doesn't understand me as a man. So Jesus came to go through all the gamut of human emotions, to go through all the experiences of a child, a toddler, a baby, a toddler, a childhood, a teenager, and then growth, manhood. The Bible tells us he went through it all. He went through it all as a man. But he's not just man. He was born of a virgin. And I've shared during Christmas time how that the necessity for the virgin birth, the signs have discovered that, that uh, the mother's blood does not go into the baby through the placenta. Once science thought that that was so, but now it's proven beyond the shadow of any doubt that the mother does not give blood to the baby. Why is that important? Because Mary, Mary's blood has sin. Are you listening? All right, so now, now it's proven that the placenta takes away the waste of the baby and gives food to the baby. Amen. The blood is determined by his Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. Nonetheless, I'm sure that Jesus' uh, bodily characteristics looks a lot like his mother Mary. Amen. But remember this, that the Bible says that Mary is favored among, when the angel appeared to her, he says, you are favored among, not above women. And that's one reason why at the cross, Jesus called her woman. It's a respectful term. It's like my lady. He never called her mother. In fact, you have no account he called her mother. He always addressed her. Kindly though, with the phrase like in in, in, among the English, you know, uh, aristocracy, they will say, my lady. It's the same term. He never called her mother. Very interesting. So Jesus came through a virgin, a highly favored virgin. He was born without sin in his blood. And what's the purpose of having blood? Without the shedding of blood, come on, there is no forgiveness of sins. Are you listening? So let's follow this right now in Romans 3. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember we stopped here? The last time I preached uh, Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration, He is the righteousness of God. Today, you and I, we receive the gift of righteousness. So, in the Mount of Transfiguration, He was flanked by Moses, a type of the law, and the prophets, Elijah. Amen? Elijah was representative of all the prophets. So here, even the law and the prophets witness that the righteousness of God has come as a gift. For God so loved the world that He gave. Amen. And the whole purpose of this righteousness, but now, look at, but now, that means what? There was a time this righteousness as a gift was not made available. But now it's available. And it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's not contradictory to the law or the prophets. It is witnessed by the law and the prophets. But this gift of righteousness is apart from the law. Apart from the law. It is not you, you, you believe in Jesus plus you keep the law. No, it's apart from the law. Amen being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I'll just put my finger here and just uh, uh, refer you real quick to uh, uh, Romans 5, 17, my favorite verse. All right, besides John 1, 17. Mine has a lot of 17, my favorite verse. Look at this. For by one man's offense, we all know that one man is Adam. 
By one man's offense, death reigned through the one. If ever you have, you have shed tears over the loss of a baby, of a relative, a dear friend, as you are crying, remember this. This was not meant to be. God never meant for men to die. Do you know God counts death an enemy? God hates death. Jesus wept at a funeral. He, he remembered this is not what man was born to face. Man was born to live forever. Live forever and forever strong, young and healthy. That's God's dream. The Father's dream for a family of people that is forever young, strong, healthy, that will rule the universe with Him. But He didn't create robots. If He create robots, nobody will sin. Everybody would obey. But He didn't want robots. He want free moral agents who can choose. You can choose whatever you want to choose. But you cannot choose the consequence. Amen? So man chose, man chose to rebel. Man chose against God, for Satan. God cannot come in and change man's choice. God cannot influence man's choice. God gave man free choice. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's how death came in. So by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. The word reign is total, it's empirical. It's a, it is a rule that no one can escape. You climb the highest mountain, you, you swim in the deepest ocean, death will still find you ultimately. And all because of Adam's sin. Amen. Everything is wrapped up in Adam's sin. Some people are not happy about that. They say, why, why should I suffer for Adam's sin? It's the same thing. If your grandfather died when you were, when he was three years old, you won't be here. Some people have to stop and think about that. There's no need to think about it. If your grandfather died, your grandfather died when he was three years old, you won't be here today. There's no mystery. Our lives are intricately linked with our forefathers that have gone on before. All right, F-O-R-E, forefathers, not your forefathers, okay? <laughs> so to one man's offense, death reigned to the one. Much more, everybody shout much more. <laughs> much more those who receive abundance. Hey, hey, those who receive, new creation church. Yeah. Those who receive, and this word receive is not just receive one time in the Greek. It is a continuous receiving, a continual con consciousness, a continual preaching, a continual appropriating. A continual walking in it. In the Greek, it is present continuous. All right, those who receive, constantly receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Wow, what a deal. And I still think many of you have memorized this verse, but I don't think we really have meditated through this verse. Number one, even if we receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, many of us don't see the reigning in life. We understand it, but we are not seeing the reigning. If you're not seeing the reigning, you're not receiving the abundance of grace. You're not receiving the gift of righteousness. And, and after you reign, just remember this, it's not just reigning in life, it's much more. Much more those who receive. It's a much more reigning. So we gotta keep on pounding this home because there are voices out there, and many of time, many of times it's behind the pulpit. Unfortunately, just like during Jesus' time, the people that bind heavy burdens on the common people were actually the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They would say things and preach things that cause and bind heavy burdens, and Jesus rebuked them. Jesus says, you bind heavy burdens on people and you refuse to even lift a finger to help them. Jesus says, woe to you. And then Jesus looked at these people and says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Christianity is not a religion. It is God reaching out to men. Are you with me? All right, so we gotta have this understanding. These twin gifts, I call them, abundance of grace, can only come when people hear abundance of preaching of grace. So the devil will come and tell you, you cannot, you cannot be talking about grace all the time. You cannot be preaching about grace all the time. There is too much or an abundance of grace teaching now this. They're complaining about that. There are people who complain that I use the, the phrase finish work too often. Be careful of voices like that because, you know, I don't care who that man or woman is, behind them is the devil 
stopping you from constantly receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And what's his purpose? He doesn't want you to reign. Because when you reign in life, he doesn't. When you reign in life, your, your addictions don't. When you reign, somebody is not reigning. There's a devil, you understand? So there are Christians today who are Christians, they are safe, but they don't understand the abundance of grace. They hear something about grace, they say, be careful. How to talk about abundance? And then the idea of right standing with God is the reward of righteousness. By doing some things, you will have righteousness. But the Bible says it's the gift. It's the gift. It's the gift. And I've said before, Singaporeans are some of the most difficult people to receive. You tell them, have a piece of cake. They say, no, 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 thank you, thank you. No, like, no, please have this piece of cake. No, 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 no. Because our culture teaches us cannot say no straight away. Uh, yes, straight away. It is rude. But in America, they think you're on diet or whatever. They'll say one time, two times, they pull away. And then you are angry that they pull away. Why didn't you, why didn't you play with me? Why well, you don't play along with me, you know? You gotta push on, then I say no, lah. Then you push on, I say no, lah. Then you push on again, and I finally say, okay, lah, if you insist. <laughs> See, in America, they don't play that kind of games. We gotta learn to receive people. Because if somebody else paid for it, and it's a gift, it's a gift means somebody paid for it. The giver paid for it, somebody else paid for it, but the receiver is not the one paying for it. But we wanna make it the reward of righteousness. In other words, you do something long enough, you've been praying long enough, you've been sacrificing long enough, you've been working hard enough, then one day you have righteousness. That's what man wants. Are you listening, people? No wonder there's no reigning in life. Hmm? Let me share with you a testimony that just came in, and I read this only yesterday. And this is a, a, a guy who uh, shares about, you know, church, we have all kinds of testimonies that's coming in of people who are reigning in life. So many testimonies, especially in the area of addictions, freedom from addictions, and uh, people who are addicted even to pornography, especially pornography and sexual deviations. They are finding freedom. They are writing and telling me that they are finding freedom applying the teaching of the power of right believing. And what is the power of right believing? Even though you are in that sin, confess, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Just like when you are sick, you don't confess the sickness, confess. God is a God who calls those things that are not as though they are, and then they, they are. God saw darkness, God says, light be, and light became. God saw an, a, a sea without creatures, and God says, let the, the seas bring forth whales and swimming and teeming with uh, fishes that swim. And there, there they were. So whatever God wanted, God spoke, and God made man in his image. So whatever you want, all right, you speak it, and you will see it. But that's God's reality, it's called faith. But man has so fallen that man has to see before he, he speaks. So when he sees darkness, he says, wow, so dark. But because he's made in God's image, God says, you will have what you say. They say, wow, so dark, becomes darker. In other words, there's no way out because man is living in the place of non-faith. So the place of faith is to walk like God and talk like God. God sees the condition, but God calls those things that are not as though they are. God saw Gideon who was trembling, who, uh, who served God only at night. Amen. And the angel came to him and said, hail. Hail, thou, thou valiant man, valiant, brave man. Amen. Jesus saw Peter, and his name uh, 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 originally means a reed. And Jesus says, Simon, you shall be called Petros in Greek. From now on, you shall be a rock. From now on, he called call him Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. And he was the one that's always, yes, yes. No, 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 no. Yes, I believe God. Oh God, where are you? Amen. You know, that kind of person. And yet Jesus called him, and one day he became a rock. A pillar in the church. Amen. Others see a shepherd boy, God sees a king. Amen. When God looks at you, God doesn't see who you are in the natural. God sees the potential, the destiny by which he has called you to. You are definitely not an accident. Amen, but you don't understand, Pastor Prince, I'm an illegitimate child. Strictly speaking, there are no illegitimate children. Only illegitimate parents. When you think about it, you think about it. Anyway, this is a wonderful testimony that just came in. I was born in a Christian family. This is local, this testimony. And I grew up thinking that God is an angry God. Since young, I was afraid of failing because I didn't want to anger God. So I started confessing every wrong deed I had done. Finally, I told myself that I would do what I wanted to do. 
first and later come back to God. Many of us have the same reasoning, isn't it? Slowly, I was led astray. My life became very bitter. I indulged in all kinds of sin, smoking, drinking, and so many other stuff. Day by day, I knew my life was sinking and I was a total failure. I didn't have a proper job and I was like a posh beggar. Even when I was hungry and had money in my pocket, I would choose cigarettes over food. I felt very condemned by my actions and decided to give my life to the devil, thinking that he would give me whatever I wished for in this world for free. Soon I came under an attack. My mind started to go haywire. One day I got overdosed on drugs and my limbs started twisting by themselves and my heart started beating very slowly. I thought I was going to die that day, but somehow Jesus saved me. A year later, I came to the end of myself. I wanted to come back to Jesus, but I did not know how. In June, I came across Pastor Prince's sermon, and that was the first time I learned that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Since then, I took hold of that truth. It's important you take hold. The Bible says, those that receive abundance of grace and the gift. And the word receive there is active in the Greek. Active, not passive. Since then, I took hold of that truth as my armor against my bad habits. Whenever I smoke, listen to this, here's where the rubber meets the road. Whenever I smoke, he still smoke. Pastors, leaders, stop thinking, well, you're giving people license to sin. People will still do things behind your back. We are telling people how to get out. He says this, whenever I smoke, from then on, I started confessing that I am righteous in Christ and cigarettes have no power over me. This is what has been taught to all these uh, uh, porn addicts, to all these drug addicts, to all these people bound in addictions in the book, The Power of Right Believing. We have so many testimonies and they are still coming in. Our uh, people set free. The last thing you want to do when you're watching porn is to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. The devil will scream, hypocrite. But you know what? If you'll confess that, you'll come out of that. You will reign over that. And you stop looking at women as objects and see them as persons and honor them and have a sense of dignity in life. So you know, treat people like objects, you end up feeling like an object. I started confessing that I'm righteous in Christ and cigarettes have no power over me. Within two weeks, all my bad habits left me. We are, we are hearing so much, I mean, so many testimonies now of this reality. But what do people do when they, when they sin? They groan, they moan. If they go to God, they keep on confessing, God, I'm a sinner, God, uh, I'm not worthy, God, 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 forgive me, like asking God to forgive them, like God is not willing to forgive them. Instead of confessing. Because if it's a gift of righteousness, nothing you do earn you that gift in the first place. It's what Jesus has done. Therefore, nothing you do can cause you to forfeit the gift. It's what Jesus has done. Amen. If what you do can forfeit the gift, hey, what you do as a sinner cannot even forfeit the fact you're a sinner. What the first Adam did is so powerful that you cannot forfeit it by doing right. You're still a sinner. So for us to make Jesus like when someone sins, they're no more righteous, they lose the gift, is actually to put the first Adam higher than the second Adam, our Lord Jesus, who is much more. Are you with me so far? Okay, let me finish this. All right, today I reign over them. Within two weeks, all my bad habits left me. Today I reign over them. It has been almost two years now and the work of God in my life continues to amaze everyone around me. God has also been opening doors for me to preach the good news in Sri Lanka. I thank and praise my Lord Jesus Christ for delivering me and saving me. Pastor Prince, I also thank God for you because you have unveiled the beauty and the loveliness of Jesus Christ unto men like me. Now, if you look, at what's been shared. The turning point happened when she started confessing, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. You see, many of you, when, when, when you become a child of God, you are now a child of God. God is no more just God. God is now your father. And that's why it's important to be obedient to the spirit of the new covenant, which is now you are a son, you are a child of God. Never call yourself a sinner anymore. There are people who say, I, I am a sinner saved by grace. I am is present tense in English. We all know that. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner saved by grace, but now I'm not saying you're free from sin, but your actions don't dictate your identity in Christ. Amen. Any more than you did something good when you were a sinner last time, doesn't make you good. 
Just because you have times that you did good, doesn't make you good. You're still a sinner. So likewise, now you're a born again believer, church. Listen, whatever you do, listen. There, is, there are consequences to what you do. You can hurt people, you can hurt your future, you can hurt your, your loved ones, you can hurt your body, you can hurt your mind. Sin is dangerous. But how to overcome sin? I am for holiness. But where many, many people differ from what I'm, I'm, I'm sharing is this, their idea and my idea of how to get their, how to get their holiness from here, they are saying you've got to have the law. I'm saying it's by grace. It's only by grace. Amen, church? I always believed in God. My family took me to church as a youngster and even into my teen years. Uh, I never accepted Christ and uh, I always knew that. And I, and I stopped going to church in my early teens and by my later teen years, I'll say about 1986, 87, I started using crack cocaine. Went to prison three times over this drug for selling drugs, for stealing cars, back on a parole violation. Every time I would get out, I would try to stay off, but I'd always go back to it. I was just so trapped in the cycle of this drug. Everything was about getting the drug and getting the money to get some more of the drug. The cycle continued and I wanted to break free, but I couldn't, I just couldn't. And my family during this time would tell me, Jesus loves you. And I say to myself, I say, yeah, I know. But I say to myself, why would he love me? Why would he love me? I, I, don't, I don't have any regard for him. I felt it was my destiny to just be like I always was. And I had resigned myself to pretty much know I would die in prison or die out there in these streets or die homeless. The only way I feel better to go do it all again. And this went on for more than 25 years. And I tell you, I just, I felt so hopeless. I told my sister, I can't live like this anymore. I want to go to church with you on Sunday. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a pastor there I can talk to, and maybe he can help me some way. That very day, I gave my life to him. December 28, 2014, my life began to change right away. It's overwhelming and amazing and unbelievable. He plucked out that desire, that drug, that meant everything to me above any and everything, he plucked it out and removed it and the desire for it was gone and it's still gone. I could never, I could never ever get off that drug no matter what I tried. That addiction, that desire, it died the, the day that it meant the love of Jesus. He came in, I, I always thought I couldn't, I couldn't come to him till I cleaned myself up. I could never clean myself up. So I, could ne I never came. Finally, I was, just, I was literally at the end of myself. And I came in all my chaos and mess and all the things I've done. He took me off the streets with no hope. He took me off the streets with no hope. My whole life resolved around cocaine. He made me a new person. He, he changed me from the inside out. And he continues. And, and, and while I'm here, I want to thank Pastor Prince because as I was a young, a new believer, so much I, I wanted to know but didn't know. His teaching has been a huge blessing to me, his sermons. They've shown me and continue to show me who I am in Christ. The power of right believing, the power of the Holy Communion. Some, it, it's incredible because sometimes I would read a passage, it was a little troubling, and maybe because I didn't fully understand. Just at random, I'll pull one of them sermons out because I listen to them every day as I drive my car. And there would be my answer or my confirmation in that sermon. You know, I, for so long, I just felt like he wouldn't forgive me, but that wasn't true. He was there all along. I wouldn't just let him in. Oh, the peace I have now, I can face things that I don't get worried or troubled. And, the, and taking me off those drugs, that meant everything to me. It's, it's a miracle. It's the same miracle as he walked on the water, as he raised the dead, because there was no way I could get off. No way. I should have been dead, but God had other plans. So I just came to share that and to tell anybody, don't make this the same mistake I did waiting so long because 
You don't have to clean up first. First of all, you can't. He comes in, he cleans up. He cleans up for you. He does the work. The work is done. I never thought I could be forgiven. I know I'm forgiven when I was in all this. I didn't want anybody that didn't know me to know. Now I want to tell everybody so they can see his. So he gets the glory. He gets the praise and the honor that he's worthy of. This is my story, but you can see clearly this is a story. It's not my story at all. It's Jesus' story. I just happened to be in the story. When I came in, he changed everything as only he can. And I give him all the thanks and the praise and the glory. I'm saying it's by grace. It's only by grace. Amen, church? I'm going to show you something very, very, very powerful, okay? Look at Colossians. In the book of Colossians, it says this, in Christ, here the context refers to Christ, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Bodily. Whoa. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the triune God bodily in human form. Do you know that of all the four Gospels, the first three are called Synoptic Gospels, but the Gospel of John stands in a class of its own. And the miracles in the Gospel of John are not called miracles, they are called signs. So the first miracle of Jesus turning water to wine is a sign. At the end of, of John Gospel, John says there are many other miracles, many other things Jesus said and did, which is not possible for one to write. If one writes it, if I suppose that even all the books in the world cannot contain it. But these are written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life. So, the miracles in John are called signs. They demonstrate something. They demonstrate his deity, because the Gospel of John is about Jesus, the Son of God. His deity, in bodily, in human form. Okay, watch this. What is the first miracle? The first miracle is to turn water into wine. Right? Now, in science we learn of this major components. Time, space, force, matter. Am I right? Right? Time, space, force, motion, motion, force, matter. I just real quick call your attention the way it appears in John. The first miracle turned water into wine. Water, if I can have a glass of water here, transparent glass, and a transparent uh, glass of wine, you will see in the natural there's no way water can turn to wine. Maybe grape juice left for a while may turn to wine, but not water. And not just wine, very good wine. So to get good wine, you gotta have a, 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 a plantation of a, a vineyard that is there for about four or five years. I read about it, how, how they, they have the best wine. They gotta wait for the four or five years. And after that, it's ready for wine making, but even then, the first few years of uh, uh, the grapes that's produced, is not as good for good wine. So they wait for another two, three years. And even then, after that, they have wine, wine that is saleable, wine that is commercial, but yet, to have very good wine, you wait for another 10 years, another 15 years, another 20 years. Then you have very good wine. Jesus compressed time in a wedding and gave the best wine. So the first miracle is a miracle of, he is the Lord, the sign is what? He is the Lord of time. Do you know the Bible says God can restore to you the years the locusts have eaten? Amen. Joel chapter 2, God can rest I will restore to you the years the locusts has eaten. Amen. Did you hear me? Restore the years for us. Once the years are gone, wasted years, wasted days, wasted nights. I wish I can have them back. God says I am the Lord of time. You don't understand, Pastor Prince, I'm not 50 years old, I'm 60 years old, I'm 70 years old. He's the Lord of time. 
You don't understand, I'm 80 years old, so was Caleb. And he says, I'm as strong today at 85 years old as I was when Moses sent me at 40 years old. Give me this mountain. Amen. It's a lot of time. You know what's the second sign? Most people know the first sign, they don't know the second sign. In the Gospel of John, the second sign, Jesus was in, in Cana, same place where he turned the water to wine. A man came from Capernaum, which is more than 10 miles away from Cana, where Jesus was, where he did the first miracle. He was a noble man, and his son was sick. So he said, Lord, can you please come and heal my son? And Jesus says, go your way, your son lives. He's speaking from Cana, more than 10 miles away from Capernaum, by the Lake of Galilee. Many of you have seen Capernaum when you visit Israel. Cana is about more than 10 miles away. And he says, go your way, your son lives. Then the Bible says to show his faith that father didn't go back the same day. The father slept one night in Cana. Next day he made his way. And then the servants came out to meet this noble man and say, your son is okay, your son is okay. He asked, when was my son okay? When did he recover? Exactly the time when Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. But this is the second miracle that Jesus did. The Bible says this is the second miracle. What does this demonstrate? He's the Lord of space, time, space. Are you listening, people? When I, when I went to Israel recently, I was on assignment, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. My luggage didn't come in. And I had to have my luggage, my clothes. Went for last minute shopping. Really, literally last minute. Had to get all the you know, basic necessities, toothbrush, whatever. I was in a nice, nice room, all right? I was looking forward for a bath, because we traveled for about, plus a delay and all that, 24 hours already. Went to bathe. My shower has only hot water. Extreme right, extreme left, hot water. And I just lathered my hair <laughs> with shampoo. And I can't go out and call because I was all, you know, partially wet and my, my head is all lathered with shampoo. So I can only do this. You know, you put your your head. It was burning, man. Then I called the hotel and the hotel says, well, you know, it's very hard for us to give you a room now because I said, look, look, I'm not asking for a suite. I'm just asking, give me a room where I can bathe. I'm very tired already, you know. Everything go, go wrong went wrong. And worst of all, my son came down with a cough that kept him up the whole night. And I received the news from text when my wife told me that. I said, that, wait a minute, this whole thing, I'm about to preach something that will go into millions of homes. All right, when it's released, you all get to see it. And I was there on this assignment. And when I heard by my son, you know, nothing affects you like a father, like hearing about your son. So I knelt down in my bed and I say, you foul spirits, a sign against me, a sign against my family to stop this, this uh, preaching of the word. I loose you from assignments and I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now just let you know this. Usually uh, children, all right, when they have coughs, it will probably go on like one week or slightly more than one week with the cough uh, getting, you know, lesser. You know, the phlegm stage, you know what I'm saying? But my, my wife told me, something happened that night. She didn't know I prayed at first. My son slept through. It's only after one or two days of constant coughing. Slept through, which means what? It is spiritual. Now, not all sickness is spiritual. Sometimes you don't rest enough. You fall sick. What you need to do? Rest. You don't drink enough water. That's why you have headache. You are dehydrated. But sometimes it's spiritual. When it's spiritual, you gotta come against the spirit behind it. Like people understand how come a, a, a pain can jump from one limb to another limb. Usually it's spiritual. If it jumps, all right? Natural things don't jump. Bind that jumping spirit in Jesus' name, amen? Amen? So, it is amazing that I was in Israel, thousands of miles away from Singapore. I was on my knees by my bed in my, in my room, in the hotel room, and I could pray, and my son could be delivered. Why? Because he's the Lord of time and space. Yes. Want me to go on? Yes. 
Oh man, the third one, real quick, because I don't, this, this is not my sermon, okay? This is just free, real fast. The, you know the third miracle he did? All right? The man who was impotent for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus says, rise, take up your bed and walk. He talks about the, the motion of the water. He talks about Jesus saying, rise, take up your bed and walk. All this talks about motion. Time, space, force, motion. And the, the sign after that, what is it? He, th- he took five, five loaves and two fish. More than 5,000 people. Counting men, women and children, about 10,000. With five loaves and two sardines. Two small fish, the Bible says. He multiplied it to feed more, more than 10,000 people with 12 baskets full left over. The Lord of matter. He can turn the matter. Don't look at your bank account and say, oh man. Look at it and say, thank you, Lord. He can multiply it. Oh, amen. Even scientifically accurate. So in Him, wow, see? You all distracted me. I started by saying, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you, child of God, you are complete in Christ. First he says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then God says, but you know something? You are complete in Christ. God has put you in Christ and you are complete. Amen. The amazing thing, church, is this. God says you are righteous. There are, there, there, there are preaching going on in churches today that says, you know, if you are holy enough, one day you'll be righteous. No, 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 my friend. You are now holy, righteous, and blameless. Your actions might not correspond yet. My son does not walk like an adult because he's still a baby. But one day, trust me, he'll walk like an adult. And he won't want me to baby him anymore. So keep on feeding the people, amen? Pastors and leaders, keep on feeding the people. Don't beat the people, feed. And they'll come to a place where their actions will correspond. But meanwhile, the truth is that whether you are a rich or poor Christian, whether you are young or old believer, you are complete in Christ. You are not less complete than one who is 10 years Christian. You are complete in Christ. And in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what we have done is that we take the starting post, you are complete in Christ. And we have, we have made it the finishing post. That's the problem. We tell people, one day, the finishing post. We think in the natural. We think like a human. Instead of reasoning from God downwards, we are reasoning from man upwards. God's reasoning, God's, God's reality is that you are complete in Christ. Even though you're safe this morning, you're complete in Christ. Now walk out that completeness. And if you fall and appear incomplete, you're still complete. Your fall does not incomplete you because your action in the first place did not complete you. It was Christ. So that's a starting post. The starting post is you're complete. Don't make the starting post the finishing post. One day you'll be complete. I'm gonna show you right now how many Christians think and that's the reason they don't see the deliverance because there's something, you know, very profound. If you come to God, if you're a child of God and you come to God like a sinner, God doesn't respond to you because He's no more God to you, He's Father. Even when you fail, you come to God as a sinner and you say, God, I, I have sinned, God. Uh, I'm a sinner, Lord. I, I'm a sinner saved by grace, God. God, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. And you think you're copying the guy that Jesus talked about who wasn't even saved. Now you're confusing the issue. Are you a child addressing the Father? Or are you a sinner addressing God? Once upon a time, we were all sinners and we addressed God. As as a sinner, we address God. We can say things that be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's right. But God is no more just God to us. He's Father. And we are no more sinners to Him. We are His children. And our cry is, Abba. I know you saw this a few weeks ago, but a proud father wants to show this off. Look at this. Doesn't matter how old you are. The cry is Abba. Abba. He's looking, by the way, he's looking at me when he does this. 
<laughs> Abba is a cry from the heart. It is not a formal, oh, Father. It is a cry. And the day the devil robbed you of that consciousness that you are a child, even when you fail, that's the day you find almost like heaven is brass. Why is there no response? Because God cannot own that position. For God to own that position by giving you a sense of his presence and all that, all right, would be for God to own falsehood. He cannot, the Holy Spirit in you cannot bear witness with a lie. You're acting like a sinner when God has made you a child. So the way out is safe, Father. Now I'm gonna call your attention to something that's gonna blow your mind right now because uh, there is a traditional teaching I'm gonna show you from the Greek as well how you can approach this. Look at this. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children. Now, my little children does not appear in John chapter 1. Only for the first time it appears in John chapter 2. 1 John 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, that means what? It's possible for a child of God, it's po possible for the, who is he writing to? For the little children. It's possible for them to sin. Aren't you glad God tells you what to do when you sin? And if anyone sins, and if anyone sins, we have, by the way, just let you know that in the Greek, we have is continually have, continually have. There's not a time that you don't have. We can continually have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Okay, once again, when you sin, if anyone sins, here it doesn't say you confess. It tells you straight away you have an advocate. Now what troubles me and, and those believers who meditate on the word, they take some time, some people don't even bother, but if you do meditate, your concern is this, advocate sounds very legalistic. It sounds like a lawyer, a solicitor, an advocate. Am I right? You can talk to me, you know. I've been talking so much, you know. Huh? I know he's the Lord of time and space. May the Lord bless the matter in your mouth, God tongue. You can say amen. It says advocate. It's a legal term, right? All right, law, lawyer, advocate, lawyer, am I right? But you see, a lawyer, we need a lawyer, legal, a legal lawyer. With God, I understand. But with the father, family, that's a problem. Why do we need a lawyer with our father in heaven? It's always been a problem. Just let you know something, okay? Now, don't, 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 don't write to me, don't draw your guns because I know this is your pet verse, whatever. Okay, those watching, check with the scriptures. The word advocate here is the Greek word parakletos, which in every other scripture is translated comforter. Parakletos. Parakletos is, is translated in our English Bible as comforter. Now, this brings to your mind straight away Jesus sharing with the disciples in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed, right? And he said, I'm going away, but I'll send you a comforter. So the Bible says helper. He didn't say, I send you a lawyer. Now, one of the ideas that people have of parakletos, para is like para church, para organization. Para means to come alongside in Greek. Kletos is help, literally help. Now you can say legal help if you want to, but that's not prominent. Help means, comfort means help. You know how many times the word parakletos appears in your New Testament? Five times. Do you know how many times the word comforter appears? Out of five times? Four times. Do you know how many times the word advocate appears for para parakletos? One time, here. So in other words, I, I submit to you, it is not talking about an advocate. Here is where all kinds of teachings come in. The devil comes to God and say, hey, uh, um, Matthews have sinned. Matthews, this brother who looks like Aaron the high priest, whose beard screams, I am the high priest. And the devil says, he has sinned. 
Then Jesus says, yes, Father, but look at my hands. And the father says, okay, case dismissed. So the devil goes off and fine. Mary have sinned. You know, we always have this idea that one day the devil, in one day the devil goes to, to God's presence so often. Have you heard that teaching before? And Jesus is our lawyer. That's not it. I don't even believe the devil goes to God anymore. You can show me Job chapter one, and I agree that there was a time when all the angels present themselves to God and Satan came. But that was before the cross. There is a place, a verse in the Bible in Hebrews that says that Jesus went to heaven and he cleansed. He cleansed a part of heaven, heavenly things with his blood. Why would you want to clean heaven? Is holy, heaven is clean. Why would you want to clean a certain part of heaven with your blood? I submit to you that that place is where Satan used to stand. Originally, it belonged to Adam. God gave Adam access to his presence, but Adam committed high treason and gave that position to the devil who used it from, from, from Adam. So he had a right in the Old Testament to come to God and accuse the saints of God. But today, Jesus went back to heaven. He cleansed that place. That place is redeemed, a type of the Old Testament where the high priest sprinkled seven times on the place he's standing. That's exactly what Jesus did. The devil can stand there no more. Amen. And the book of Revelation says, the accuser is cast out. Amen. The accuser is cast out of heaven. So what does this verse mean? We have an advocate. We have a comforter. Now, five times it appears. Four times it refers to the Holy Spirit. One time here, it refers to Jesus. We have a comforter with the Father. And with, prepositions are important in the Greek. With here is not with, actually, is the word pros, which is towards. We have a comforter towards the Father. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say a, a, a boy, 10-year-old boy, misbehave, all right? And uh, the father, at a, at a ta dinner table, the father says, get up, go to your room. Go upstairs to your room. The boy gets up, go to, I mean, this, this kind of thing can happen, right? The father just disciplined him, go to your room. All right, the boy goes to the room. The mother follows soon after. And the, the boy is crying. So the mother comes, the mother comforts the boy. Now, the mother is not saying, you are right in rebelling, you know? Father doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> That's not good. So Jesus never come and comfort our sin. He comforts us. He reminds us. How does he comfort us? He reminds us about what he has done. But he never sanctions sin, you understand? But he's there even when you sin. He's talking about when you sin. So the mother says, come, I'll go with you. Towards Abba, towards daddy. I'll go with you. I'll be alongside you towards daddy. It gives the child confidence to have the comforter mother beside him. That's what Jesus is doing. Hallelujah. If anyone sins. Amen. Okay, you're not excited. I go home. Huh? <laughs> you know, when we teach things like this, the, the thing is that miracles happen. Something about the truth that the Holy Spirit bears witness with truth. You know, when I preach on rest in Jesus' faith for miracles, I have a title called Rest in Jesus' Faith for Miracles. I talk about when you know you're complete in Christ, what do you do? <sighs> you rest. There is no rest when you're trying to get something, striving to get something, striving for victory, praying for victory. But there's such a rest when you're praying from victory. You still pray, but you pray. That's why when you pray, you must come to God before you come to God, don't, don't, just, don't just come and throw your request so fast. Just come and know that He loves you. Amen. You're coming to a Father. Don't talk about the God of the universe. He is the God of the universe. But you must not allow how people see Him to be how you see Him. You have a different relationship. He's your Father, a Father that loves to hear your voice. In the Song of Songs, He says this, let me hear your voice. But before He says, let me hear your voice, He says, let me see your face. Let me see your, thy countenance and then let me hear your voice. Notice the order. It is your presence that he wants, not just your voice. It's one thing for Jessica to talk to me on the staircase or in the living room, and I'm in the room. Uh, uh, Daddy, yes, you know, but I would love for her to come in my presence. I don't want to talk. I can hear her voice. So the Bible says, God wants to see your face and then hear your voice. So when you come to God, you have a prayer request. You know, just, and just know that He loves you. 
when you come to His presence. Stop there and just say, just know He loves you. He's a God who gave Jesus to die for your sins, but now He's your Father. And talk to Him, say, Father, have a conscience that you're in the presence of the one who loves you infinitely. He finds no fault with you. And He delights that you're coming to Him. He delights that you're trusting Him with your prayer requests. See that and see if your prayers are not answered. Because when you come in a lie, you come to Him like He's God. You sense distance. It's a lie. Everything is a lie. God cannot own that lie. God cannot answer and own that lie. For God to give you an answer is to own that lie. And that's the reason why you don't see results. Sometimes it's not the words you say, it's just coming to His presence and say, Father, and know this, He loves you. The new covenant is not about your love for God, it's about His love for you. And you need, to, you need to know that He wants to hear my voice. He wants to see my face. Father, you know, many times when I pray to the Father, I usually start off by saying, Father, thank you for loving me. Have you ever thanked Him for loving you? Thank you for loving me. It gives me a sense that He loves me. Long before I bring my prayer request, I must have that sense. I must have the sense that He longs to, to have me in His presence, to hear my voice, to see my face first, then to hear my voice. I must have that. Now I'm telling you, this is the confidence we have in Him. Amen. If we know He hears us, we know that we have the request we desire of Him. Hmm? It's amazing how we, you know, that this testimony here, I just want to share real quick. Are y'all blessed? Yes. This is from Honolulu. Da, 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 da. In 1993, this brother from Honolulu, he said that, it's a short one. In 1993, I was in a car accident that injured my spine, messing up my fourth to fifth lumbar vertebrae. As I could not walk, I had to undergo back surgery in 1995. The operation only made my condition worse, and I was in pain every single day. Some days worse than others, even my right knee and right shoulder were affected. For 15 years, my daily prayer was for healing and release from this excruciating pain. Then in 2008, I listened to a teaching by Pastor Prince titled, Rest in Jesus' Faith for Miracles. Even the faith for miracles, you don't, you don't come and say, I need the faith. I need the faith. You know, it's like so much strife. You gotta be, your complete means what? Is faith lacking? No, it's not. Just rest in Him. If I need faith, He will supply. You know the analogy of the vine and the branches? Whatever is in the vine flows in the branches. The only way to stop the sap is for the vine to try to tighten up. I must try my best. <laughs> Nothing flows, you know. Okay, he says that for 15 years, my daily prayer was for healing and release from this excruciating pain. Then in 2008, I listened to a teaching called Rest in Jesus' Faith for Miracles by Pastor Prince. I shared it with my husband. We were both excited and blessed by what we had learned, and it revolutionized my thinking about faith. I began to repeat. That's all she did. I began to repeat what Pastor Prince taught about Jesus' faith, but I wasn't praying about anything in particular. That night, 15 years, excruciating pain. That night, as I prepared for bed, my back made this snap, crackle, and pop sound twice. When I bent slightly over the sink, crawling into bed, I noticed that my back didn't really hurt. When I awoke, the agony in my back was gone. What a miracle! Praise God, hallelujah, amen. No hula baloo, jumping up and down, you know, like commanding all the time, just resting. Just repeating what I said to a husband. When I, as the day progressed at work, both my knee and shoulder became free of pain as well. I was even able to walk up and down two flights of stairs. I'm so thankful for the teachings on grace by Pastor Prince, what a blessing. Now. The, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And if you reign, your addictions don't. If you reign, your sins don't. If you reign, death doesn't. If you reign, no power of darkness, amen, can have the victory over your life because you are reigning. Hi, this is Joseph Prince. 
I just wanted to share that this year is a very special year for me because it is the 15th anniversary of my very first major book, Destined to Rain. Over the last 15 years, Destined to Rain has been translated into multiple languages and reached more than half a million precious people all over the world. I am humbled by how the Lord has used Destined to Rain to find people in some of their lowest moments. That is why this year, we are publishing a special 15th anniversary edition of Destined to Rain and making it more available and accessible than ever before. It is now available as an ebook on the Joseph Prince app. This special edition includes some new material. Earlier this year, I penned down some of my reflections, personal notes, and new meditations as I read Destined to Rain again. I've added all this in the new edition now available on the app. There are also some additional content like teaching clips and specially selected video testimonies to encourage you and help you get the most out of the book. Even if you have read Destined to Rain before, can I encourage you to get hold of this 15th anniversary edition and receive these life-changing truths afresh? And if you know a friend or loved one who needs to hear the gospel of grace, please consider sending them a copy of this ebook as well. My friend, with every purchase you make, you are helping us bless five more people in need of this book, completely free of charge to them. This is part of our ongoing Gospel Partner mission to give away as many books and resources as possible to people who may not be able to afford it. Joseph Prince's book, Destined to Reign, 15th Year Anniversary Special Edition, is available for purchase now as an ebook or audiobook. Explore more about the book and its features on gospelpartner.com slash rain. You will also receive an exclusive set of decals when you order during this launch period. This is a limited time offer, and it's only available when you purchase on gospelpartner.com slash rain. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, church, you got to be careful with this man's teachings. Even your friends, your colleagues, I can tell you this. This is not natural teaching. Grace is not natural. What is natural is this. Do your best to please God. And one of these days, if God sees that you are sincere enough, you're earnest enough, you know, maybe you'll be more complete than John over there, than Lucy over there, you'll be better off. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I might exaggerate a little bit here, but that's what people think. It is, it is, it boggles your mind to say you are complete to start off. Now with that sense of completeness, walk out. I want to show you something, and uh, because of time, this is winding down. I'm going to show you something back to back, okay? And I'm a contextual preacher, which means I preach things in context, in the way it appears in the Bible. In John chapter 19, don't have to turn to it. Listen, you turn to it, you waste my time. Because number one, many of you can't find it. Number two, I have to wait for you to find it. Number three, some of you pretend you find it. So listen, at home, go on to open the Bible. Come here, open your Bible, okay? Just take down your notes, okay? When you write down verses of Scripture, always write down the chapter and the verse first. Like 1920, just write 1920, then the book John. Don't write down the book first. You might forget the reference, okay? In John 19, it's a story of the cross. Right? Why did Jesus cry at the cross towards the end? It is finished. All right? It is finished. John 19, verse 30, he cried, it is finished. Am I right? That's where it all starts. Where he cried, finish, we start. We start our Christian life with the finished work. When Jesus says it is finished, what is finished? The cup that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, full of our sin, full of our curse, full of our judgment. He drained, he drank it, he drained it dry. This very last dregs. Finish, the judgment is gone. There's no more judgment for you and me. What about God's law? Satisfied. What about 
God's holiness magnified. Because God's holiness says, if you sin, you die. Somebody died. God did not say, okay, never mind. I'll compromise my holiness. No, Jesus died in our place. God's holiness is magnified. God's love expressed for men, for sinful men. It's finished. His first words recorded in the Bible when he was 12 years old was this. Didn't you know he told his father and mother, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? His first recorded words. His last word was, finish in the Gospel of John. His earthly life. What was finish? The father's business. To have our sins forgiven righteously on a judicial foundation. Hmm? Then, this is John 19, right? Then he rose from the dead on the third day, the disciples were afraid, they were in the upper room, they were hiding behind closed doors. Jesus appeared, and by the way, he's not a ghost. He, he, he told one of them to touch him. Flesh and bones. That's the kind of body you and I will have. And it's flesh and bones, yet it can transcend time and matter. You can't understand everything now because we are so confined in this world, but in the world to come, in the body you're gonna have, it's a body that's physical. We and, you and I can shake hands, yet we'll transcend time and matter. And that's why when the rapture happens, He transforms us first before He raptures us. Because in our new body, two things, you can transcend matter, even though you're in a cinema, even though you're at a star. Many of us can't take the height in our old body. We're afraid of heights. So He changes us in a new body where there's no fear. I think so, the last part. Okay. <laughs> so. When he rose from the dead after it is finished, he meets them and he shows them his wounds, which is the righteous foundation for, for him to say this, peace be unto you. So peace be with you comes next. John 20, that's John 19, it is finished. John 20, in the next chapter, peace be with you. Huh? Peace is founded on the finished work. And then the next chapter, we are going to John 21 now. One week after he rose from the dead, he was walking by the Lake of Galilee. The fishermen, uh, his disciples were fishing in the Lake of Galilee. You all know the story. He made breakfast for them. After he finished breakfast with them, he asked this question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Next chapter, John 21. Look at the sequence. Do you love me? Comes after it is finished. Peace comes based on the finished work. Then he asked, do you love me? I'm going in order, people, the order of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that chapter 21, he looked at Peter and said, you follow me. You follow me. You got it? Now, the true Christian life starts with, is predicated on, it is finished. You're complete in Christ, it's finished. Your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. Now you should possess the peace. He says, peace be with you. Receive it. Therefore, being made righteous with God, we have peace. Amen. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Amen. With God. Okay, possess it. Then after that, he asks you a next question. After you are resting in the finished work, after you are enjoying the peace with God, you know that there's no, no more war between you and, there's nothing you know, between you and God anymore. God is your father, you're so close to him. He asks, after all that I've done for you, is there anything in me that you see that will cause you to love me? It's a question. We say yes. Then he asks, do you love me? And then when you say, yes, Lord, I love you, then he says, follow me. Get it? I'll tell you what traditional Christianity teaches. Start from here. <laughs> Begin by following Christ. You people, <laughs> you are too lazy to follow Christ. All right, lazy to wake up early in the morning, lazy to do this, lazy to do that. You must begin to follow Christ. Only those who follow Christ will be raptured depending on your doctrine, your background. Only those who follow Christ will make it. Don't think easy Christianity, sloppy, agape, greasy grace can get you into heaven, okay? 
It sounds so amazing. It sounds like, wow, man, this guy is preaching to the fire. Yeah, what fire is it? It's strange fire. <laughs> it's starting from the wrong foundation. Begin, they teach you, begin to follow Christ. All right? And do your best to love Him. Do your best to love Him. And then you will have peace <laughs> when the work is finished. Don't laugh. How many of us still believe this? And I've shown you the, the sequence of the appearance of these words. It is not natural. I tell you this, if I take the brain of a Christian by surgery, take their brain out, wash with the detergent of Jesus' blood, all right? Then I put their brain like this, the other way. Every Christian will become victorious Christian from this week on. Will think like God. We still have thinking like, the more I tell people who I am, what I've done, I'll be great. Jesus says, the more you know, the more you serve, the greater you'll be. It's all upside down. You know, like we have, uh, you know, the barber chair? Like someone beside you, you want to play one up man you just make it higher. <laughs> then this guy realized, he also make it higher. Then at the end, you make it higher, he make it higher. <laughs> Don't even play the game. Hey man, why look at each other? We have to look at Jesus. Every disappointment comes when you compare yourself with somebody else. Do you understand this? This is the sequence. It starts with, it is finished. Amen, church? Now, there was a man, there was a man who was caught in a breach of the law of his land. It was obviously a breach of the new found law, okay, new founded law. And he himself did not deny he broke the law. His enemies admit he broke the law. His friends would say, it is the law. But one thing about this guy, the culprit, he's not, he's not too particular about the fact he broke the law. He is almost at peace. The only one who's concerned is the king who loved him, the king of the land who loved him. I'm talking about the story of Daniel. Daniel has King Darius, the Middle Persian emperor, King Darius. In fact, you can even see his face in history. They have uh, notched his face into uh, clay tablets. You can see in the museum. That's the King Darius of Daniel. King Darius loved Daniel. But his satraps, his governors around him, his leaders around him, they were jealous of Daniel because the king kept on promoting him. And Daniel was not even a Middle Persian. Daniel is a Jew. He was a captive from Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, all right, he took Daniel and all his, 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 his people with, with him. But of course now, Darius has conquered Babylon and the Middle Persian took over. And King Darius loved Daniel because Daniel was able to interpret dreams, give him counsel, sweet spirit. And the Bible says that in Daniel was found an excellent spirit. And the king thought to put him above all the satraps and all the governors of the kingdom. So they were jealous of him. So one day they came and they realized they, they have no, nothing against Daniel. Daniel was faithful, the Bible says. The only thing, the only fault they can find with Daniel with, with his God. So they came to the king and they told the king, king, why don't we do this? All right? For, for a certain length of time, let's have a law in honor of you that no man in your kingdom, in your realm, should make a request or pray to any man or any God except to you. How about that? And King Darius, being a busy man as he is, you know, with other things on his mind, he just agreed, all right, and put a signet on the law, the clay tablet. One thing about the law of the Middle Persians, it cannot be altered. Once it is made law, it cannot be changed. And true enough, they waited for Daniel to pray. And the Bible says Daniel, knowing that the law was enacted, he went up to his upper room chamber. Before all of them, he knelt down and prayed towards Jerusalem. He prayed, the Bible tells us, openly. And straight away they went to the king and said, King, you have this law, don't you? And the king says, yes. That anyone should not make requests of any, any man or deity except to you. And the king says, yes. And uh, well, Daniel, the moment the king heard Daniel, 
The Bible says the king, read carefully, it says the king was displeased with himself, not with Daniel. The king loved Daniel. The king realized that he was set in a trap. And they told the king, and remember this king, O majesty, O most noble one, whose flatulence is as a perfume of the night. <laughs> o most noble one, the law of the mid-Persian cannot be altered. The king has put his authority on it. And the king understood that. And the Bible says the king labored all day until sundown. That's in the Bible. It says he labored all day to try to find a way to deliver Daniel out of the lion's den. Oh, by the way, the, the consequence is that whoever does that will be thrown into the lion's den. So the Bible says he labored all day until night, until the, the going down of the sun. And towards the evening, other governors came to him and says, remember this, O majesty, we are concerned for your kingdom. The law of the mid persian cannot be altered. At the end of, so, so, so we have a king here whose law and his heart does not match. His heart was all for Daniel, one direction. His law was going in another direction to throw Daniel into the lion's den. To keep both, he cannot. He must either do violence to his heart, his love for Daniel, or satisfy the claims of justice, his justice. But to do both, he cannot. At the end of the day, justice won. The king reluctantly says, Go ahead, take him. So they took Daniel and they threw him into the den full of lions. By the way, these are ferocious lions. These are not pussycats. <laughs> They're not meow, okay? These are ferocious lions. How do I know that? Because later on, when the enemies were thrown in, even before their bodies hit bottom, their bones were crushed by the lions. And the Bible says that night, after Daniel was in the lion's den, the king could not sleep. They didn't bring dancing women before him. One translation says that. They didn't bring music before him. His sleep departed, he could not sleep. Early in, oh, by the way, when he threw, he, 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 took, he took Daniel into the lion's den, Daniel, last words Daniel heard was this. The king says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And the Bible says, he did not sleep that night. The next morning he got up, he went quickly, the Bible says, to the Daniel's lion's den, and um, he says, oh Daniel, has your God delivered you? Let's follow the story here. Then the king arose very early in the morning, went in haste to the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver from the lions? Next. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him. Not just glad, <laughs> you know, he loved Daniel. And commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. But watch this, next. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. So I told you, these are, these are real ferocious lions. Had not eaten for days. Now, the Bible records twice the accusers came to the king and reminded him the law cannot be changed. Now, supposing for the sake of illustration, look up here, just for the sake of illustration, okay? I'm closing with this. Just suppose that between the first coming, reminding the king, and the second coming, in between, the king actually threw Daniel already in the lion's den. Okay? But these accusers do not know. So the second time they come to the king and they say, King, we just want to remind you that the law cannot be altered. The king says, yes, definitely not. They look at the king. 
And the law says that you are to judge Daniel and throw him into the lion's den. He says, I certainly will not. Now remember, we're talking about after he has thrown, nothing has happened to Daniel and he brought Daniel out and they did not know. So the accusers come, okay? And he says, of course not. Uh, but, oh, but you just said that the law must be kept. Certainly. Daniel broke the law. Yes, he did. You have to throw him. I most certainly will not. King, O thou, whose toe jam is the delicacy of the poor. <laughs> you know how they flatter the king. O king, we are concerned and jealous for your honor. This will put a blot to your name, to your dynasty, and it will be a lasting disgrace upon the honor of your excellent name if you don't throw him. He said, no, I'm as righteous yesterday when I threw him as today. I'm as righteous in not throwing him in. You know why? Because he has served his sentence. Now stop here and let's bring this to a close. What happened to Daniel has happened to all of us by substitute. Jesus is our Daniel. He went to the lion's den for you and I because the law cannot be broken. But all of us have broken the law. The law of the king. All of us. Okay? And but instead of us going, Jesus went. On a, that's what I mean. Christ died for us. What is for us? As us. Instead. Instead. In English, instead means in the place of. Us. So like Daniel, Jesus went to the lion's den, the cross, took all the judgment that was meant for you and I because of the broken laws in our lives. We have violated God's commandments. Amen. He took our place. He was punished to the fullest extent for all our sins. And then he cried, finished. And the king, God the Father, raised him from the dead out of the, de the place of judgment, the lion's den. Amen? And he did it all not for himself, he did it for you and I. So now the accuser, usually through the mouths of people, but the person behind the accusation is actually the devil, who is called the accuser. Use the mouth of people. They'll come and say, but so and so broke the law. Even today he comes to you, but so and so has, God, he has done this, he has done that. He must go. And God says, no, he will not. And when I say he will not, I'm as righteous as when I send my son to the tree to die for their sins. Today I'm righteous in not condemning my people. If I condemn my people when their substitute was condemned for their sins, it's a miscarriage of justice. I will be unrighteous. I will be unrighteous. So I cannot be unrighteous. It will be a blot on the name and the throne of the holy God who created the heavens and the earth. I cannot judge them. I cannot condemn them when they have belief on my gift, on my son, the, their substitute. And because of that, I'm as righteous in clearing them from guilt as I am in sending their substitute on their behalf. Can you understand that? When I was reading this, yesterday the Lord spoke to me. But son, see what happened to all the accusers. They were thrown with their wives and their children into the lion's den. I want to tell you something, church. When it comes to another child of God, whatever it is, what God has cleansed, don't you call unclean. You don't know the full story. You don't know uh, whatever it is. Don't be an accuser. Don't do Satan's work for him. Okay? It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And we know who the lion is today. Who goes about as a roaring lion. But the only ones that he can devour based on this verse is, are the ones who accuse others. In other words, they are like him. Hmm? Another thing, you should not accuse yourself either. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in closing, you know, I've been wanting to do this as much as I can, but time is really of the essence here. I want you to sit back. Once again, I'm going to show you that video that we did for more than a year of Jesus on the cross. And I want you to sit back and watch this. 
and remember that what He did was for you and I. Amen. Now that's, that's the reason why, I'm going to dismiss you right now, but that's the reason why you should never allow the devil or anyone to condemn you or receive accusation. You see, when you are not conscious of all these truths, when you are not listening to the gospel on a constant basis, it's not one time hearing, but constant hearing, you'll not be strong in what Jesus has done for you. And when you're not strong in that, that's when the devil can put things on you, on your children, on your family. Even sickness was born by Jesus. When you realize that, it's a revelation. You stand up and say, if he was sick in my place, I receive my healing. He was paid. <laughs> Will you receive the gift of righteousness? It's yours. The reason why we are saying there is no condemnation is present tense. Now, no condemnation for you and I who are believers in Christ. The reason we can say that is because God is holy. God cannot punish the same sin twice. 
and all your sins and all my sins was borne by Jesus Christ and were already punished long before we commit them, even before we were born. God saw our sins and put it on Him. Because they have been condemned, because our sins have been punished, there is therefore now, because God is holy, no condemnation for you and I in Christ. Can I have a good amen? amen. Now, listen, does that make you want to sin? No, it makes you want to love Him and learn more of this wonderful Savior who gave His life for you and I. Amen? All across this place, I just want to lead those who never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. Therefore, what He did for you as a substitute has not become actualized or real in your life because you have not made Him your substitute. You have not made Him your Savior. And if you'd like to enjoy what He has done, pray this prayer with me right now. No one looking around. All right, don't go to hell for somebody's sake, okay? No one is worth your soul. Amen. No one can ever be in hell one day saying that they are there because of God's judgment. No, they are there because they refuse God's love. Amen. The way out is given. And it's much more that you might reign in life and not be caught under life in death. If that is you, wherever you are, friend, you want to pray this prayer to receive Jesus. Pray this prayer right now with me from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me. That in your love, you have no desire to condemn me or send me to hell, but you loved me. And instead, you send your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins on the cross. He shed His blood, cleansing me from every sin. You raised Him from the dead, and He is alive today. And Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, now and forever. All my sins forgiven. God is now my Father, and I am His child. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Stand to your feet. Let me dismiss you with the blessings. Remember this, protection is one of the gifts that Jesus gave and God will not force protection on people. You must want to be protected. Amen. Jesus said this uh, when he, get, he said, I will gather your children under my wings like a mother hen would gather her chicks. But Israel, O Jerusalem, you will not have me. And what a tragedy of 2,000 years that we have sinned, not from God, from the devil attacking His people, but how many of us want to come under His wings? Don't take protection for granted. Amen? Amen? You will not die in your sleep. Somebody here has that fear, and I just the Spirit say, you will not die in your sleep. Maybe your friend died of heart attack, whatever. It will not happen to you. You know who you are. I just heard the Spirit say, to say this, okay? Lift your hands all across this place. This coming week, the Lord bless you with the blessings of Abraham and the blessings of Deuteronomy 28, and the Lord Himself keep you. If the Lord Himself keep you, you are kept. The Lord Himself keeps you from accidents, dangers, sickness, disease, from evil people, from all the powers of darkness, and from the evil one. The Lord make His face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and grant to you and your families his shalom in Jesus' name. Children of God, remember to call him Father and sense his love. Amen. God bless you. See you again.